All right, we are going to talk about uh, mechanical complications and other complications of acute myocardial infarction today. So this is the drama. This is the stuff that I love in the cardiac ICU, which you may or may not often see at university, but plug, if you come rotate with me at Jewish Hospital, you may in fact see some of these things. So these are um, less common in the modern era because we tend to get to people with heart attacks faster, but it's still possible. And when you're taking care of people in the hospital after they've had particularly STEMIs, these are the reasons why we keep people in the hospital. So you, you guys have probably seen, right, a STEMI that comes in, they get stented, they look totally fine. They're not in any heart failure. They're walking around. They feel great. And you wonder, why don't we discharge that person? Well, we wait for at least 48 hours because we're monitoring for some of these complications. But beware that they can happen five and then up to 14 days out from acute myocardial infarction. So little question. I do this with the fellows, but you can have an advance on your cardiology boards, which I know many of you will want to take in your future. Um, what are the, all the following are risk factors for cardiac rupture, except which of these following? And this may surprise you. You may have seen it. If you saw the answer earlier when we were going through the slides, don't answer. Anyone know? Okay, so I have a vote for hypertension. I have a vote for age being not a risk factor for uh, cardiac rupture. Okay, you're all wrong. This is the one time when diabetes has not been associated with a bad outcome. So I guess the more important way to understand this question is that the risk factors the patients are going to be most concerned about who are at high risk for cardiac rupture are people with hypertension, older women, first presentation of myocardial infarction, and those who wait to come to the hospital <coughs> until late. So um, that doesn't mean it can't happen in other people, but those are the people it tends to happen in. One candy for someone who tried to answer. Yep, good, right there. <laughs> That's the person who didn't show up. <laughs> okay. Someone can scavenge that after. <laughs> I'm going to start with a very dramatic case from the end of my fellowship, and I'll tell you that this was the first time that I had myself seen this complication because, again, this is pretty rare for this to happen in the modern era. So we had a 63-year-old woman who really hadn't gone to the doctor very much, but we knew that she had hypertension and that she had a 50-plus pack year tobacco history. In Baltimore, that's significant. In Louisville, you can get that like at age 25. <laughs> so, she had no prior history of infarct, so first presentation, like I just told you. And she'd been having chest pain for two days, but it wasn't bad enough until she was in the casino. And when she got really bad chest pain, plus shortness of breath, and could not breathe, that they finally called 911. But she had been waiting for two days with sort of ongoing stuttering chest pain. By the time the ambulance got her to the hospital, she was in shock, so hypotensive, 60 over 40, and in hypoxic respiratory failure. She also was showing on telemetry intermittent bradycardia with first-degree AV block. So already you're starting to get a little bit concerned because all the signs are pointing towards badness. She had a little bit of VT, only furthering your suspicion that myocardial infarction is high on your list. So they started her on amiodarone. And then when they did examine her, good job, doctors at outside hospital for examining the patient, she had a loud apical murmur and a palpable thrill. So that means when you put your hand on her chest, you feel underneath your hand, which is also bad, but kind of awesome. So this is the echo that we performed when she got to us, but I want to show you what's going on here. Uh, so this is an apical four-chamber view. We have the probe at the apex of the heart, so that's where the probe is up here. So this is your left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. Your anatomy seems to be fuzzy because what is this? What's going on right here? <clears throat> and actually I should say the atria are kind of further down here. This is color doppler, which shows you where blood is flowing. You're seeing a lot of mixed color, which means turbulence, but you are noticing that blood is flowing across the interventricular septum. That's not normal, okay? So this is a VSD that this woman has, ventricular septal defect, from her acute myocardial infarction. They took her immediately to coronary angiography, which was appropriate because they were concerned that this was from a STEMI, and you have to revascularize these patients early. She had 100% in her proximal RCA, so that was the culprit vessel. Her, one of her osteal branches of the circumflex had a 70% and her LAD was 50%. They also did a ventriculogram, which I can't, I don't have, so I can't show you, that showed this large inferoceptal ventricular septal defect. So that's where they put the catheter into the left ventricle, scored in some dye, and you could see the dye going into the right ventricle. They put in a balloon pump, started her on pressors, quickly stented that right coronary artery, and then said, help, and sent her over to us. 
So she came in about three in the morning, and to complicate matters, I've already told you she was in shock, so she had lactic acidosis. Then we figured out she also was in DKA on top of everything else. So her glucose was 700, her lactate was five, she was pretty acidotic, she was intubated at the time, but alert and responsive, brain totally fine. So we put in a PA catheter, also wise known as a swan, and I, also wise, that's not a word, otherwise known as a swan. <laughs> And we were measuring the pressures because we wanted to make a diagnosis and to understand a little bit about her filling pressures. Now, we've gone over PA catheters a little bit before in here, but her CVP was 16. Is that high, low, or normal? Someone said high. Yes. So that's high. Your CVP is hopefully around 5 or so. So this is um, evidencing that she has now volume overload on the right side. Her PA pressures were 37 over 18. High, low, normal. It's a little bit high, so 25 over 10 is what's normal. Remember, nickels, quarters, and dimes? So this is a little bit high, but it's actually not as high as you would expect if she has a bunch of blood coming from the left ventricle into the right ventricle and through her pulmonary circulation. So this right there told us her RV is not working because her RV is what has to generate the pressure to go through the pulmonary arteries. So that gave us a hint. And then her wedge pressure was 25. High, low, or normal? High. High. <laughs> Terrible, terrible. That was left-handed. Good, so that's high, evidencing her left-sided <laughs> volume overload. Then we did a cool thing called a saturation run. Anybody familiar with a saturation run? So we do this a lot in congenital and pediatrics because you're trying to figure out what blood is flowing where. And this is how you understand the mixture between arterial and venous blood. So if I right now take blood out of your right atrium and I measure the saturation on it, that tells me a bit about oxygen extraction, right? So we've talked also before about how that can help you understand cardiogenic versus septic shock. Anyone who's rounded with me, and I think we talked about it in a lecture. But you expect this is venous blood. So do you expect the saturation to be greater than 90% or lower than that? Right, so it's venous blood, okay? So what we do with this saturation run is as we're putting in the swan, in each chamber of the heart, we take a sample of blood, and we look for what we call an oxygen step-up. Because the oxygen saturation, when by the time it's mixed in the right atrium, you've got your IVC blood and your SVC blood, it gets mixed, goes into the RV and into the PA, it should not change between the RV and the PA because it's not getting oxygenated, right? So we're looking to see, is there any step up? And that tells us that there's oxygenated blood getting in from somewhere into the right side. And this can give you a little bit of a hint about where the connection is. We kind of did this for kicks in this case. So our SVC was 62%. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So we're going to go down if you're mixing in one or a side. You're right. So that's the most deoxygenated blood. But by the time you're in the um, right ventricle, it's all already mixed. So you can measure high right atrium and low right atrium and try to figure that out, but you'll usually see um, that it um, goes up sequentially between the chambers. Um, so her SVC was 62%. <clears throat> her right atrium was 63%, going in with the swan, and then her RV, whoa, 94%. That is arterial blood. So that's telling us there's a huge shunt coming from her left over to her right. We knew that, but we sort of proved it here. A 5% increase is enough to say that there's a shunt. This is like a 30% increase, okay? Big old shunt. This is the best picture that I have of it. So this is the um, subcostal view. So you have the probe right underneath the ribs. This is her left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. You know that because the probe is here on the skin. And remember that your right ventricle is the most anterior chamber. So you hit right ventricle first. This is the back door into the RV. Does so everybody see how the septum is separated here? And there's a connection between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Can everyone appreciate that? That is gnarly. That's a technical term for it. Here's the color flow. Just flowing right across there. <clears throat> so, as you would probably expect, this is not compatible with life. So uh, we can talk more about um, management of this, but in general, you want to get them to surgical correction as soon as you can, but there's always debate because these people are very, very sick, and the surgeons will tell you that this infarcted tissue is like wet tissue paper, and so trying to sew a patch onto it is very tricky. Interventional cardiologists can try to put a plug in there, but again, there's not very much for it to grab onto. So this has a very, very high fatality, 92% in all comers. So we, she came in at 3 a.m. I was, I was still there. At 8 a.m., she deteriorated despite being on three pressors and a balloon pump. So we actually put her on ECMO in our CCU. We're retaking blood out of the um, uh, venous side, 
oxygenating it through an oxygenator and putting it into the arterial side to try and support her. Fortunately, she developed a GI bleed because you're heparinized when you're on ECMO. She had a worsening lactic acidosis despite having this amount of support. And she got febrile, had gram-negative bacteremia, bad news bears, oligurecrenal failure, critical illness, neutropenia. So now, of course, there's no way she's going to the OR, right? Because she's had a bleed, she has no neutrophils, she's in renal failure. So this is what happened to these patients. And then the family opted for withdrawal of care. We were able to get an autopsy on her, and so she had multiple things that happened, but one of them was she had a bowel perforation. That's where that gram-negative came from, because of bowel ischemia. Now, the bowel ischemia could have been either because she was in shock for days and not perfusing her bowel, or... Does anybody know another um, risk of ECMO that could have done this? Why you heparinize then? Exactly. So she could have had an arterial clot that flew to her bowel and then caused the ischemic bowel. Then she had a very large MI, 6.4 centimeters, posterior, back of the heart, infarct, going all the way from the base to the apex. So her whole posterior inferior wall was completely infarcted. This large VSD and then her coronaries. This is actually her. So this is her very muscular left ventricle. That tells you she's had hypertension for a long time, right? Thick walls. It's also decompressed. Here's this thin wall right ventricle. You can't you appreciate the difference between the left and the right ventricle? It's pretty cool. This is, so that's anterior, septal, lateral, inferior, and posterior. See all this white kind of stuff here? That's all of the infarct that she suffered. And then this is the ventricular septal rupture, where it's right here at this infraseptal part going from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. Not survivable. So that's my introduction to today's topic of mechanical complications, okay? Any questions on her case? We're going to go through um, a bit about the different kinds of complications that you can have. So I kind of put them into a couple categories. Ruptures is one. So something bursting that shouldn't, (laughs) breaking apart of muscle. You can have the ventricular septum rupture. That can be apical or basal, depending on which artery had the infarct. You can have acute mitral regurgitation. This is, can be from a couple of different mechanisms, which we'll talk about. So you could have a pat muscle rupture. So the pat muscles, remember, they're what tether down the cordy that keep the mitral valve in place. And if one of those muscles get, gets infarcted and ruptures and starts flying, you can have uh, mitral regurgitation. But you can also have the mechanism where the um, inferior wall, usually, of the heart gets infarcted. So now, instead of squeezing, it just stays still. And so it tethers the mitral valve leaflet down and kind of tethers it open. So that can be another way you get mitral regurgitation. It's not a rupture, but still MR. And then your free wall can rupture, which is also disaster. Um, I'm going to talk about RV infarction and RV failure because although you might think, oh, it's the RV, who cares? This is actually very fatal events and very difficult to deal with and treat them. Aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms and then pericarditis. So we'll try to get through all of this, but we'll start with rupture since we already talked about that case. So risk factors for ruptures, I just told you, see if you can remember. What are the risk factors? Hypertension! Age old! Female gender! Two more. Sorry? <laughs> Good. Not diabetes. It's not a risk factor. Delayed presentation. Whoa, you're eating. Watch out. And, um, and one more. Huh? Yeah, first am I. Oh, if you were more athletic and I were more athletic, that would have worked. Okay. <laughs> Good. So those are our risk factors for uh, rupture. So anytime that someone has had an MI and suddenly they become hypotensive, that's when you got to worry that something has ruptured. This is a catastrophic event. So they're sitting in the ICU after they've had their MI and all of a sudden, boom, hypotension, heart failure symptoms, you got to worry that something has ruptured. And then they'll go rapidly into shock with inadequate tissue perfusion because some blood is going the wrong direction and not enough is getting out to the tissues. So the VSD, in terms of timing, that's how we think about these different complications because it tells us what people are at risk for. So we typically think of the VSD as in the two to five day range. So this woman, remember, she had been having chest pain for two days. So she was on the early end for when she could have a VSD. And also that makes sense, right, because the pathophysiology of this is that you get the myocardial infarction and then you have reperfusion to that area. Then you bring in all your neutrophils. You bring in your um, macrophages. You start to digest the tissue and it becomes floppy and then boom. Um, but you can have it as early as 16 to 24 hours has been described in the, in the shock registry. So the shock registry is this really cool registry um, that um, this woman named Judith Hockman 
um, came up with where she just in the U.S. would take people who came in with shock because of some because of myocardial infarction and just got the data on how many people are coming with this, how many are coming with that, who lives, who dies. So in this registry, the incidence was about 4%. So it does happen, but not that frequently. This is a Linux trial from the early eras before we did stenting. It was only about 0.2% in that trial. So it may be that in the modern era, this happens a little bit less. The shock registry was, um, I think, uh, early 2000s. This has the highest mortality of all the complications, except free well rupture, but that's because you just died. There's no time to get any data on you. Okay, so 100%, 100% mortality if they don't go to the operating room or get it fixed. 100%. This is the argument that we have with surgeons all the time. We know why they don't want to take them, but they'll die if they don't take them. But even if they take them, 87% uh, mortality. So this is very, very difficult to deal with. I know of one in all of my training that successfully made it through. Um, if you have an inferior myocardial infarction, like the woman that we just talked about, RCA or circumflex artery, you're going to get a basal VSD. So that means up towards the base of the heart. If you have an anterior myocardial infarction from your LAD, it's going to be apical. That kind of makes sense based on what feeds what. The magnitude of the left to right shunt is inversely proportional to the size of the infarct. I'm going to say that again. The magnitude of the left to right shunt is inversely proportional to the size of the infarct and is directly related to LV function. So think about that. If I infarct my entire anterior wall, so my heart's not working anymore, <clears throat> the amount of shunting I'm going to have is lessened, right? Because my, my left side is weak, so I can't pump as much blood into the RV. If I just have a small little infarct, but it happens to rupture my septum, then the rest of the LV is powerful, and it's going to be able to squeeze a lot of blood into the right ventricle. So this is a little bit counterintuitive, but then makes sense once you think about it. Okay, so this is a, a from the shock registry. Okay, it's published in 2000, so the data was collected 80s and 90s. So this is looking at people who show up to the hospital in shock because of a myocardial infarction. And it's looking at the mortality. So all comers, if this is, again, a little bit of historic data, but if you showed up in shock from your MI, 60% death. We underappreciate this. This is really important. But if you look at all the different complications you can have, ventricular septal rupture, that's the highest mortality. So that's just to emphasize that point. So what do you do for these people? <laughs> Panic? No. You make some phone calls. But let's talk a little bit about the medical management of what you can do. So first of all, you got to make sure you're diagnosing it. So a thrill, right? That's when you can feel under your hand. That will only be about 50% of the time. So just because you don't have a thrill doesn't mean they don't have a VSD. Um, you can do this, the stat run I talked to you about to look for the step up, but really echo is going to be the main diagnostic way that you do this. Part of why we get an echo for everybody post MI. Most of that's just to look at LV function and regional wall motion, but you might pick up a VSD that you didn't otherwise see. So the medical therapy, is, um, this is where, you know, you really have to put on your big boy and big girl pants and be brave. So if you have room in their blood pressure, you want to decrease the left to right shunting because that's part of the problem, right? So the way to do that is blood just flows through the path of least resistance. The RV is a very low resistance chamber, so it's easy for the blood to flow there, right? The pressure in the RV is 25 systolic. What's the pressure in your aorta systolic? 110, 120, whatever. So if you can afterload reduce them, and if you can decrease their systemic blood pressure, then you might get some of the blood to go out into the systemic circulation and decrease the amount of left to right shunting. So that's one option if they're normotensive. Then you gotta give them inotropes if they need it because of the RV or LV failure. Sometimes you have to also give them pressors to maintain their blood pressure if they're not, if they're already hypotensive. So this is one of those you just sort of throw everything at them because you're trying to improve cardiac function, trying to maintain tissue perfusion. You can think about mechanical support, right? This is a mechanical problem, so medicines aren't going to fix it. Balloon pump, that's probably not going to do very much at all, but we usually go for it because it's easy to do in the cath lab. You can think about percutaneous support, which is the, um, the ECMO that I talked to you about. I'm not going to get into that too much here because it's sort of a big <coughs> topic. But if the heart is not pumping sufficiently, you can do some sort of temporary ventricular assist device or something called an ECMO plus an impella device. We can talk about that in another lecture. But this is the advanced kind of decisions that we're having to make in the cardiac ICU about how to support them while you're trying to see if you can get them a little bit through some time and, and let the VSD area heal a little bit before you fix it. But then you need surgical correction. 
So I already alluded to the fact that the timing is a little bit controversial. So people who, there's this paradox, right, of if you wait to repair it, they have better survival. Well, why is that? It's because the people that can make it 48 hours before they go to the OR are the ones who are going to survive anyway. So you're just cherry picking your patients here that you're going to, that you're going to correct. Um, but that, again, so that there's a selection bias. And I've told you about the difficulty with sewing that in infarcted tissue. So this is a, a debate and a controversy every single time that we have one of these patients. And it's a very difficult decision to be made. But what I like to quote is they have 100% mortality if they don't go to the OR, and they have a shot if they go. So if otherwise they're a relatively good candidate, I try to push my surgical colleagues to do this. But you only can push so far. Any questions about VSD before I move on to MR? All right. So now we're going to talk about mitral regurgitation. This is a subject that I think confused me until I started thinking about it more and, and did some cardiology training. So there's these two different mechanisms by which you can get MR in the setting of MI. You can have MR for lots of other reasons, but I'm just talking about mitral regurgitation in the setting of acute MI. So the first one makes some sense. If a pat muscle ruptures, now you have a leaflet that formally, you know, it's like a parachute. They have the leaflet with the cordy going down to the pat muscle. If that pat muscle ruptures, now you have the whole leaflet and apparatus that can just completely reflux during systole. So you'll have wide open MR from that. That, I think, is pretty easy to understand. But the other one is what we actually call ischemic MR. I'll show you a picture in a minute, but this is where... <clears throat> so here's normal ventricle. Left ventricle, left atrium, aortic outflow tract. Here's the pat muscle with the cordy. And then here is your mitral valve leaflets. So normally, it closes, and the, the pat muscle keeps it tethered here so that the mitral valve leaflets cannot go backwards into the atrium during systole. If I now get an infarct that infarcts this wall, instead of during systole, this wall squeezing in and out and maintaining this geographic configuration, now this wall is hypokinetic, so it doesn't squeeze. So it just stays in place. And so now, the cordia are actually pulled downward, and you're tethering open that mitral valve leaflet, which allows for some of the blood to reflux. Does that make sense? It's different than if whoosh, rupture this pat muscle, now my whole thing is going back and forth. This is actually tethering it downwards so that it can't fully coact or can't fully close, and that allows for mitral regurgitation. This is thinking about it anatomically, what happens here. And this is most common in an inferior myocardial infarction because this inferior wall and pat muscle are fed by either the CERC or the RCA, depending on which is dominant. Does that mechanism make sense? Any questions there? Okay. Um, so um, this happens about 7% of the time. If you really have acute, severe mitral regurgitation, it would make sense if that's from pat muscle rupture as opposed to tethering, right? This is going to be much more dramatic if the pat muscle is ruptured and flying around. This can be, again, at two to five days. Most ruptures are going to happen in that time frame because of the mechanisms we talked about. The, how they present, it's not hypotension, it's acute pulmonary edema. All of a sudden, can't breathe because all of that blood is rushing back into their lungs. Now, this is a, a point of also uh, content, not contention, but this is a little bit difficult to understand. So you would expect that if you have severe MR, you'd hear a raging murmur, right? It's severe, so I should hear a large murmur. Remember that a murmur just means turbulent blood flow. And turbulent blood flow has to be because there's a pressure differential between chambers, right? If I'm just letting blood flow along a continuous spectrum, there's no turbulence because it's the same pressure. But if I put a kink in the hose, now I'm going to have turbulent flow because I have different pressures in those two chambers. So in acute, severe mitral regurgitation, where I had a leaflet, that was fine, and then all of a sudden it's flying open, there's almost no pressure gradient between my left ventricle and my left atrium because it's just wide open. So you may not hear a murmur. And you may not see any color flow Doppler on your echo. You might only be able to see it by actually looking at the mitral valve leaflet and seeing it go in and out. So this can actually be a little bit of a tricky diagnosis to make. If you're like, well, listen, there's no murmur. Well, there might not be a murmur. So um, transthoracic or transesophageal echo are going to be the best way to diagnose this. And then if you happen to have in a PA catheter or you've put one in, so remember the wedge pressure? That's a surrogate for which chamber in the heart are we trying to look at with a wedge? The left atrium. So if I have severe mitral regurgitation, what am I going to see on my wedge tracing? What would happen in the left atrium? So the overall pressure will be high, but what I'll really see is that instead of having systole, diastole, right, like an arterial tracing, wait, there, for you. I'm going to see, that's atrial, systole, and diastole. I'm going to see that during ventricular systole, 
I have a big amount of pressure coming in. So that's called a big V wave because of the ventricle. So we might see that and that would help us to diagnose it. Um, this is a, an absolute emergency. These people have got to go to the OR and there's really no debate about that. If they're not hypotensive, you can also give them vasodilators, same principle. You want to get more blood going through the ventricle into the um, uh, systemic circulation. So if you can try to decrease afterload, then you might be able to reduce the severity of the MR. I showed you that. So here's some pictures. These are echo pictures. This is a transesophageal echo, so everything's upside down and backwards. That's the left ventricle. That's the left atrium. That's the mitral valve, aortic valve, aortic outflow tract. So blood goes like this. See this right there? That's not normal. Do you know what that is? That's a piece of the pap muscle. That used to be down here or down here and has right there. See, it's broken. And so now this little piece is flying up into the left atrium. And then you see it there as well. You get another piece of candy. Because you answered right. Yes. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Questions about mitral regurgitation in the setting of acute MI. So two different mechanisms. Separate them in your mind. If it's very dramatic, it's probably from pat muscle rupture, two to five days. Okay, the last of the ruptures is going to be a free wall rupture. There's not much to say about this because it's that bad. So, again, somewhere in that 5%-ish range, but that's in the shock registry, might be better in the modern era. 10% of all mortality after acute MI. So if they tend to die suddenly and dramatically, it might be because of this. This takes a little bit longer, five days to two weeks. It's a full thickness wall that you're rupturing, so this would require some time for those macrophages to eat through. There's a couple of different types. Um, type 1 is if you have this full thickness rupture just because of a massive MI all of a sudden. Type 2 is that the, is the macrophage is eating it away, like we talked about. And then type 3 borders up, don't worry about it. <clears throat> there used to be this discussion that maybe thrombolytics made this worse. You don't need to worry about that because we don't do many thrombolytics in the modern era. Um, the reason you need to be suspicious of this is if you see an effusion on a post-MI patient with hemodynamic collapse. Now, why you'd have time to have the echo if they have hemodynamic collapse? Well, maybe you have it right there. Maybe you're already expecting it. But then if you have an effusion plus hemodynamic collapse, you have a free wall rupture. So what do you do about it? You pray. But then also, emergent pericardiocentesis to try and pull out the blood because really tamponade is the first thing that they're in trouble from. And then you clamp the catheter to try and prevent any more fluid from building up. And then surgery. But again, there, if you can get them through this to the time they go to surgery, they still have a very high mortality there. So this I've never seen. I hope to never see it. Uh, but it's something to know about. So here's some autopsy specimens. So this is the heart. This is your heart with blood. That blood came from the inside of the heart to the outside. And right here, that hole is where the free wall ruptured and the blood came out and caused tamponade first and then exsanguination. And then if you look um, here, this is left ventricle, right ventricle. Here you have this full thickness um, free wall rupture. And you also see it here and you also see it here. Okay, that's free wall rupture. Questions about ruptures? All right, let's move on to one of my favorite, RV infarct. Let's make a diagnosis. Who wants to read this ECG? Semi, good. Who said semi? Inferior. Keep going. Okay, inferior. So 2, 3, and AV, F are up. And now I want you to tell me, for the money, which blood vessel is it? How do you know? Good. So, do you see that the amount of ST elevation in lead 3 is like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? And the amount of ST elevation in lead 2 is about 2 millimeters. Can everyone appreciate that? So, if 3 is greater than 2, remember where your vectors are. Where is 3? Where is 2? So, 3 is pointing to my RV. And so, therefore, if 3 is higher than 2, that makes you suspicious of the RCA. So that's step one in the diagnosis. What's the next thing you do after you see this ECG? So you call the cath lab, and then while, you, while they're on their way, what other diagnostic tests do you get? Good. What are you looking for? Not posterior. So we're looking for RV involvement. Because, just because you infarct in your RCA does not mean that your RV got involved. That might just be going over to the inferior wall of the LV. 
So you're looking to see, do I have an RV infarct complicating my STEMI? Because then I know that I'm in for trouble. This is not going to make it all the way back there, but I'm going to try. It's a, oh, it's like a parachute. Okay. So in right side of these, all of these stay the same. These are just the limb leads, right? So you don't move any of that. But how do you do right-sided leads? What do you do? Yeah, and how do you change them? Right, so V1 and V2 stay in the same place, basically. You just take 3, 4, 5, and 6 and put them over to the other side. So V4R is going to be the closest to your RV, and here we have elevation in V4R. So this is just an injury current pointed towards my RV, so this tells me I have RV infarction. Going back to this, your uh, sensitivity of this for RCA is 98%. Three greater than two on your EKG, that's pretty darn good. And once you see this, your sensitivity for RV infarct is 99%. So this is a very good test. Call the cath lab first, and then get this so that we can document it, okay? <clears throat> Point is that. So RV infarct and failure, you have to maintain a high level of suspicion for this. Oh, whoops, 80%. I told you 99. I lied to you. 99% is if V1 is elevated in the setting of an inferior infarct, then you know you have RV involvement. But, okay, don't worry about that. <clears throat> so how would you be suspicious? What's the clinical presentation going to be like for RV infarct? What do they tend to have? Hypotension. What else? They might be, what's that, OJVD? Okay, sure, so you might see evidence of heart failure from right-sided congestion. What else? So if you give nitro and they get hypotensive, that should make you suspicious. It's a good reason. If you see that um, ECG with 3 greater than 2 and then you have V4R up, if you give nitro, I will kick you in the teeth. So don't do that. What else? How will they feel besides chest pain? Yeah, bleh, pukey, bagel, right? There's a lot of bagel tones. So they're going to feel pukey, nasty, diaphoretic, pale. <clears throat> and then what about conduction system? So they might be bradycardic, and they might also have some block because your RCA feeds your AV node and your SA node. It's very hard to infarct your SA node, but you might have some degree of heart block. Complete heart block, Mobitz 1, Mobitz 2, something like that. So you think about all those things. These people are sick, 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 sick. I can't emphasize it enough. The RV gets is like the poor, orphan, neglected chamber, but these guys are sick as dogs because it's really, really hard to support the RV. <clears throat> if you can get them through about two days, usually the RV improves. So they can be sick on five pressors and inotropes and balloon pump, considering ECMO in the CCU, and if you can get them through that 48 hours, oftentimes the RV starts to heal and they get better and perk up. So you just got to ride it out and try your best. Don't throw in the towel. So the way that we manage these people... First and foremost, you need to give them fluids. The fluids are there because they're preload dependent, right? Their RV, which used to be pumping, has now become this little stack of nothing. And so in order to get blood through the RV into the LV, you have to maintain preload. But if you give them too much fluid, you're going to stretch inside, you're going to stretch the pericardium, and you're going to push the septum over towards the left. So you have to give them some amount of fluids, usually two to three liters, and then stop. But that's your first move. You can be squeezing fluid in on the way into the cath lab. Oftentimes we'll do some sort of hemodynamic monitoring because we need to understand their what their volume status is, wedge versus CVP. Do we want to give or do we want to take volume? These people can be very difficult to assess clinically, so most of the time they'll end up with a PA catheter, also known as a swan. Sometimes you have to have them on inotropes. And you'll hear people say things like, oh, we're going to give epi because the RV likes epi. Or, oh, we're going to give milrinone because the RV likes milrinone. And nobody's ever asked the RV, what do you like better? So that's kind of made up, right? It's just myocardium. So you're trying to do the best you can without harming them. So sometimes you're just trying what works. Now, there's some uh, credence to the idea that milrinone might decrease your pulmonary pressures because it's a vasodilator. So then your RV might like that, right, if the pulmonary pressures are a little bit less. But if they're really hypotensive, you're going to be putting a combination of things anyway. So really no one, I've never seen any data that convinces me epi is the drug of choice for the RV. Milrinone is the drug of choice for the RV. So whenever people say that, I'm like, that's nice. Is it working, right? Um, reperfusion. I started that because there was a time when we didn't know whether or not people who came in with shock from an MI, whether we should just treat the shock and get them better and then think about the coronaries or whether we should go get to the coronaries first. We honestly didn't know. 
So it will probably, that sounds ridiculous to you because this is a reperfusion era, but these people should go and get reperfused right away, and then you deal with the shock. Oops. Um, if you have some sort of conduction system disturbances, you might need to do a transvenous pacer. So that's possible to do. And then these people don't like to be in AFib. Their RV is so delicate. Anything that changes their RV filling is going to be bad for them. So I've had patients before, actually at the same time as that VSD patient I told you about, I had another woman who had a bad RV infarct. And um, she went into AFib and woo, her pressure started to tank because she needed the atrial kick to try and get through the RV. So you cardiovert those people out of that. Don't try to medically manage it. Just shock them out of their AFib to try and get them uh, better synchrony. And then you might consider inhaled nitric oxide or now I think we have inhaled slowly on prostacycline in order to decrease the pulmonary pressures. This is just a little bit, oh, that's V4R. I'll talk to you about INO in a second. So this is... Um, Pretty cool data. This is looking at one variable, elevation in V4R. So remember I showed you that if you have elevation in V4R that you have an RV infarct? So this is looking at people who had that and those who did not have that. The first table is their 24-hour outcomes, and this is their hospital stay outcomes. So on the dark bars are people who had V4R elevation. The light bars are those who did not. Everything is worse if you have V4R elevation. Death, shock. Uh, some sort of AV block, meeting for a pacer, VF, VT. And it's even, it's also worse at hospital stay. So that one test alone that you're getting while the cath lab is coming in tells me a lot about what am I in for in the coming days of their hospital stay. Isn't that so amazing? This is old data, 1993, but I think that's really cool. I already showed you the right side of these, just reminding you yet again, get the right side of these and mark it on the top. Put right sided so that we're not confused about, oh my gosh, are they having, now they're having an LAD infarct and they're having, an, oh my gosh, what's going on? So mark it as right sided. This is just a little bit of data about inhaled nitric oxide for RV infarct. We don't have any data that says it does change our outcomes, but we have some hemodynamic data. So the dark bars are when they put on inhaled nitric oxide and then this is before versus after. And what you can see is that everything gets better. So the PA, the right atrial pressure goes down. PA pressure goes down, pulmonary resistance goes down, cardiac index goes up, wedge pressure goes down, systemic arterial pressure doesn't change, so that's good news because you're directly delivering and inhaled nitric oxide straight into the lungs. And then your systemic resistance stays pretty much the same, heart rate stays the same. So this shows better hemodynamics with the inhaled nitric oxide, um, but it's hard to know if that really changes their outcomes. So you'll see me reach for this in those patients that are really struggling, the RV's in real bad shape and we want to try something. Apparently, inhaled nitric oxide is a lot more expensive than the inhaled process cyclin, so that's what is used here. So that's fine. doesn't matter. Just something that directly goes into the pulmonary um, circulation to try and vasodilate it directly without affecting your systemic circulation, therefore offloading the RV. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, quickly, because we're almost done, we're going to go through pseudoaneurysm and aneurysm. Does anybody know the difference? Not who's going to do a cardiology fellowship, someone else. What's a pseudoaneurysm? And I'm talking about in the left ventricle. But the same term actually applies anywhere. We use these terms pseudoaneurysm or aneurysm. Do you know what the difference is? Go ahead. I mean, aneurysm is typically full thickness above all three walls, whereas a pseudoaneurysm is just, you know, partial wall or... Excellent. I don't have any candy heavy enough to make it there. We're going to try. Someone just give that to me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So a true aneurysm involves the full thickness. A pseudoaneurysm does not. So what does that mean in the left ventricle? So a pseudoaneurysm of the left ventricle is just, she's eating it right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so this is a contained rupture of the LV free wall. So you broke through some of your walls. A, a true aneurysm would just be all the walls are dilated out. But here, there's actually separation in the wall. And so some blood has gotten through, but you have containment of that rupture so they didn't die like the true free wall rupture that I showed you. It communicates with the body of the left ventricle through a narrow neck. This helps us differentiate a pseudoaneurysm versus an aneurysm. And then the outer wall, what's holding it all in, is just pericardium and a thrombus. So this is where you had a rupture, Blood leaked through, but then it formed a thrombus, and the pericardium contained it. So this is also a surgical emergency. I've seen this one time. Actually, the same woman that came back with the same presentation twice, two years separated. 
<clears throat> what you might see are persistent ST elevations on your ECG. If you've rounded with me, you've probably heard me put that into your differential of persistent ST elevations even after they've been revascularized. And then you have to get some sort of imaging modality in order to um, find it, and you have to take them to surgery because you have to go and repair that area so it doesn't just become a full rupture. So here's what it looks like. This is an echo image. So this is a little bit confusing, but this is an apical four-chamber view. So the probe is up here, left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, but then you have this whole giant thing, and there's a little, small, tiny neck. So this is where you had rupture of the left ventricular wall. Blood came through, but the pericardium, which is this layer, stretched to contain it. <laughs> and I guess there's some mural thrombus in there too, but holy smokes, that's as big as the left ventricle, right? That's very impressive. Here's an MRI image, so now we're cutting through the body. You know, feet are over here, head is into the screen. So right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle. <clears throat> this person also, uh, it looks like they have a VSD, but I don't think they do, that's just where they've cut. But do you see here this little narrow neck and then this outpouching of blood, the pericardium, which goes around the heart, and you can see that's the layer of pericardium is containing this small area of a contained rupture. So pseudoaneurysm, despite the word pseudo in there, is a surgical, you have to treat them surgically and you have to get them there quickly. If they're not having any symptoms, they may not. This probably developed over a long time. But you still need to get them to surgery because eventually the pressure inside here will be too great and it will rupture. Now that's as opposed to an aneurysm. Aneurysm just means that you got a big scar in your heart and the scarred area of the heart dilated out and caused an outpouching from the left ventricle. So it's due to this thin scarred myocardium. The wall is um, actually a scar. So the wall is not pericardium or mural thrombus, it's just a scarred ventricle. This can also cause persistent ST elevations, but you're gonna have a wide neck because you just took the infarcted area and ballooned it out. And the way that we treat this is, well, too bad. There used to be a time when they used to resect these, and then we realized that that didn't actually do any good. So the only thing is that if you see a thrombus in that area, right, it's probably going to be a low-flow area, then you would anticoagulate them. This is a great picture of an aneurysm. So left ventricle, little tiny right ventricle, and you can see that this person had an anterior MI. So that's the anterior wall, septum, inferior wall, lateral wall. This was probably a proximal LAD because it got to my septum. So this whole area was infarcted, and it remodeled that scar, and so now it's just this little thin, floppy wall. And you could imagine that this part is pumping, this part is not. This is a great place to get a thrombus and then get a stroke. So if you see thrombus, you anticoagulate. If you don't see thrombus, you don't prophylactically anticoagulate them, but you worry that they might develop a thrombus eventually. Okay, um, we have like two or three minutes left. Yeah. We're fine? Okay. Um, this is not exactly mechanical, but we'll talk a little bit about Dresler syndrome, which is pericarditis post-MI. I should have not. I should have put this up before I told you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to give me a diagnosis and get a piece of candy? Pericarditis! Okay, so you might look at this at first and be like, whoa, take them to the cat lab. And they're probably coming in complaining of pleuritic chest pain, right? It, it hurts, it feels better when I lean forward, it kind of uh, hurts when I take a deep breath in. But what you notice is that the ST elevations are everywhere. So inferior, check. Lateral, check. Anterior, check. Anterolateral, check. So there's no one artery that can do all of these territories. So when you see diffuse ST elevation, and then what else do you see right here? PR depression, right? Because my isoelectric point is this. This is a test of how steady I can hold the pointer. And then my PR is depressed. So diffuse ST elevation, PR, depression, this is pericarditis. And this is usually going to be 24 to 48 hours after MI. And that, oh, sorry, this is different. Post-infarct pericarditis is different than Dresler syndrome. Post-infarct can happen immediately after your MI, 24 to 48 hours, and it's transient. You might diagnose this because they're in the CCU when you're doing your excellent comprehensive physical exam that you do every day when you're grounding with me, and you hear a friction rub. Anyone know what a friction rub sounds like? Have you heard it? So either, if you have long hair, it sounds like when you rub your hair together by your ear. If you don't have long hair, it's like um, stepping in snow, like that. That kind of sound, that's what a friction rub sounds like. And it can have one, two, or three components to the friction rub. You also have your ECG that will make you suspicious. So treatment here is a little bit tricky. Normally you'd want to treat pericarditis how? NSAIDs. 
But in the setting of a recent MI, that's not a good idea. It's class three indication, so you don't want to give them steroids or NSAIDs for a couple of different concerns, mostly um, related to bleeding complication, and then also related to the way that the wall, re the wall remodels. You can consider high-dose aspirin for the treatment, and you can consider colchicine for the prevention of recurrence. But if you develop an effusion, which is part of what happens in pericarditis, right, because they're making inflammatory debris and cells, your inflammatory cells are making um, fluid, you've got to be really careful with your anticoagulation. So a classic example of this is someone comes in with an anterior MI, their EF is low. If someone has an anterior MI with a low EF, we'll often anticoagulate them with heparin and they're already on dual antiplatelet therapy with their aspirin and their clopidogrel, then we notice that they have this effusion on their echo two days later, we're going to stop the heparin because we don't want them to bleed into the pericardium, but obviously you have to leave the aspirin and the clopidogrel on board to protect the stent. So it can be a little bit of a tricky diagnosis, but no NSAIDs and no steroids for post-MI pericarditis. That's separate from Dresser syndrome, which develops a little bit later. So this can develop like weeks to a month after you've had an MI, you can also have it after a cardiotomy, so after you've cut in through the pericardium, this can happen. This will present with fever, leukocytosis, pleuritic pain, and effusions. And in this case, you can treat them with NSAIDs if it's been more than a month since their MI. Bleeding risk and wall remodeling is, is um, less risky then. So you treat those two a little bit differently. Pretty common for us to see this after a large MI. We just kind of conservative therapy, get them through, and hope that they don't have too many symptoms from it. Okay. Um, bradyarrhythmias, just two seconds on this. We talked a little bit about the AV node can sometimes get in, um, affected by an infarct. Um, however, it's not that it's truly infarcted. It's really, really hard to truly infarct the AV node. It's just ischemic and high vagal tone. So usually it'll come back for you if you wait. Uh, so you have high, sorry, high parasympathetic tone, this necrotic debris around the AV, AV node. Um, it, there's a three times higher rate of AV block in inferior versus anterior MI because, again, more likely that your RCA, which has the artery to the AV node, is going to impact the AV node. But this is very interesting. If you have AV block after an MI, it increases your mortality threefold. So don't just ignore it. Um, if you develop a bundle branch block, you also have worse mortality. I want to take a moment to just give you a quick caveat about new left versus new right bundle. Some of you have rounded with me and heard this. What's the classic teaching about chest pain, chest pain plus a new left bundle? Right. Now, why? Why did someone tell you that? Is there a particular artery that the left bundle signifies? So let me ask you this. What is the blood supply to the left bundle? Good, that's right. Nobody really knows. It's multiple different arteries. What's the blood supply to the right bundle? It's the first septal perforator off of the LAD, okay? So the point is, left bundle is fed by lots of arteries, right bundle is fed by your LAD, the big guy. The reason that we teach you new left bundle plus chest pain equals STEMI is not because the left bundle branch block in and of itself is an ischemic marker. It's because it's difficult to interpret the ST segments with the left bundle. You may have heard about... The Scarbosa criteria, which help you to interpret the left bundle branch block and ischemia, don't worry about that right now. But it has nothing to do with the left bundle itself. It has everything to do with how the left bundle impacts your interpretation of the ST segments. However, if, so if you say to me, chest pain, new left bundle, I'm like, okay, all right, well, let's see the patient and decide what's going on. If you say to me, chest pain, a new right bundle, lights and sirens. Because the new right bundle does signify a particular artery and it signifies proximal LAD. So this teaching that you all hear, I want you to keep in your mind that if you see a new right bundle, I'm actually more worried than a new left bundle because I know what a new right bundle means. A new left bundle, I don't know what it means in terms of which artery is impacted. So keep that in your mind. Yeah. Uh, what about new right bundle branch blocks in the same clinic? Uh, yeah, totally different. No problem. If they're not having active chest pain, that's probably just from faulty wiring and very common to get right bundle. Or if they um, have had, if they have a pacemaker or if they, um, sorry, if they have an ICD, they may have knocked off the right bundle or if they're a transplant patient, all of them have right bundles because we're always going into the right side. So in clinic, I'm not worried. 
Um, they may have had something, an infarct that happened, but if they're not having chest pain, cat's out of the bag. So I would just do what, uh, what you otherwise would have done in terms of symptom management, investigation for coronary disease. But it's in the ER. Great question, though. Okay, so that's a quick note on we sometimes have to put in temporary pacemakers in the setting of brain arrhythmias and acute MI. Complete heart block, that makes sense why you need to put in a temporary pacemaker. Alternating left and right bundle, that's real dangerous because that means that it's like the electricity could kind of go here and then it kind of goes here. So you're just sort of two steps away from complete heart block. So we'll put it in there. Um, if they get torsad because of bradycardia, then we'll pace them faster and a couple other reasons. Symptomatic brady, obviously. All right, so I leave you with this idea. Preservation. Action will be taken to prevent the next disaster as soon as possible after it has occurred. So the take-home message from today is that these mechanical complications unfortunately cannot be anticipated, they cannot be prevented, they can only be managed once they happen, and the truth is that you can't fix the mechanical problem with medicines.